Please take your Bibles and turn back with me, if you will, to that passage of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. As you know, what we're doing is we are looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. The New Testament teaches us that those ten failures of Israel and other examples in the Old Testament were written for us in the church. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, that's the Red Sea crossing out of Egypt, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did drink the same spiritual drink. They got the manna and they got supernatural water from the rocks, it says, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But now, here's the warning. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. God killed them. God still does that today. Now these things were our examples to the intent. God had a purpose in recording all of those events that happened to Israel in the Old Testament. There are examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters. And of course, we're studying the golden calf right now, and that's where they were idol worshiping, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And that's a quotation right out of our text for today. Neither let us commit fornication, sex sins, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. God killed 23,000 people for sexual immorality. Now, you know, the wilderness failures were written as specific warnings for Christians, and Paul says so. Verse 9, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye. You, these seem to be little sins to us. God killed people for this. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Verse 11, Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. See, well, all that stuff happened 1400 B.C. I mean, that was... 3,500 years ago. Those things happened to them because of us here at Bible Presbyterian Church in Collingswood, New Jersey today. That's what Paul says. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You think you're getting away with it? Be careful. The same thing can happen to you that happened to Israel in the wilderness. And just remember, it is not too hard for you to get out of the sin. Because Paul says so in verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is his common demand. What tempts you? What is the sin that you're currently involved in? What sin is in your life and you say, it's too big for me? God says, no, it's not. The devil will tell you it's too big. But God says, no temptation has ever grabbed hold of you except a common temptation. Everybody faces the same kind of temptation. In fact, he says, not only do they face it, but God is faithful who will suffer you, not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. In other words, he won't allow the temptation to be too strong for you, that you may be able to bear it. He's going to make a way of escape. God always makes a way of escape so you don't have to do the sin. That's verse 13. You know, the fact that all these things in the Old Testament were examples for us. Just, it's not just Paul that says that. Peter says it too. Second Peter 2, 6, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those who should after live ungodly. And of course, he's talking about homosexuality there, Sodom and Gomorrah. To make sure we don't miss the point, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was the example for today. God repeats it in the epistle of Jude. Jude verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, now get the next phrase, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. People, that's why God wrote the Old Testament. Because he loved you today. 
It says it all over the New Testament. If you study your Old Testament, you will see examples of what makes God bad and what makes God happy, if I can use those terms. The things that are pleasing to God and the things that God hates. The way in which God responds to sinners who insist on continuing in sin and the way that God responds to sinners who repent and turn away from their sin. To the one it's judgment, to the other it's mercy and grace. But there has to be repentance. That's the key issue. The hard-hearted sinner who continues in sin, no matter how nice they are, God is going to judge them. But if they repent, if they turn away from it, if they say, I don't want to have anything else to do with it, God shows his mercy. God shows his grace. God shows his goodness. God shows his blessing. And the Old Testament examples are for us. And so that's what brought us to the rebellion test number five, which is the golden calf. Uh, and we learned the first lesson about the golden calf deals with impatience, a serious example for us today. Israel it wasn't patient. They didn't want to wait for Moses to come back down off the mountain, so they made Aaron their leader. And, uh, of course, uh, patience can be boiled down, we said last week, into three key principles. Number one, patience is absolutely essential to the victorious Christian life. You will not live a victorious Christian life if you don't have patience. Number two, impatience always leads to rebelling against the will of God and lands you in carnal sin. Number three, patience has two sides. First, it means that you not only refrain from your natural impulses, but that second, you carefully examine every option to see if it fits biblical principles. You don't just grab the first option that appeals to you and run with it. You check it out to see if it's in harmony with the Bible. Finally, we contrasted patience with sloth. Genuine patience is not sloth for three reasons. Number one, the Bible sets patience in contrast to sloth. Number two, patience must be exercised by faith to obtain the promises of God. And of course, you know that walking by faith is never sloth. And number three, God not only commands patience, but he actively does things in our lives to develop patience. And he always uses suffering to develop patience. God uses suffering to develop patience. We may not like it, but that's what God does. Second major lesson we learned from the golden calf failure is compromising leadership always bends to politically correct pressures. I've had people in this church tell me, don't preach on such and such a subject. Because if you preach on that subject, somebody will be offended. And we wouldn't want to offend anybody. Oh, really? Jesus offended people all the time. Paul offended people all the time. Moses offended the people all the time. If you look through godly leadership, you find that they offended people. You look at the prophets of the Old Testament. Isaiah was constantly offending people. Jeremiah constantly offended people. He got thrown in jail for it. Ezekiel offended the people. They preached the truth and they preached against sin. And when they preached against sin, people were offended. But God said, do it anyway because he'll bring some to repentance and the rest are hardened like Pharaoh. Moses preached against Pharaoh and his wickedness. And Pharaoh hardened his heart and he ended up with a ruined nation and his army drowned in the Red Sea. People, that which offends our flesh is what God says to preach. You have to preach the truth even if it offends the flesh. So, the second lesson we learned is Compromising leaders always bend to politically correct pressure. And Christians are warned against that in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, where Paul warns the Christians to beware of apostates who tickle the uh, itching ears of the compromising church because the compromising church doesn't want anything except what's politically correct. And by the way, that's written especially for pastors and elders because in verses 5 through 10, Paul reminds the church leaders that in spiritual warfare, we have a twofold responsibility. Number one, to fight faithfully against apostasy in light of eternity. And number two, to stand firmly against falling back into loving the present world. The third lesson we learned from the golden calf, and I'm summarizing these very quickly for you. The third lesson that we learned from the golden calf is that people always support bad leadership and bad theology financially if it gives them feel-good experiences. And the corollary to that, of course, is that compromisers rarely support good leadership and good theology financially because it doesn't tickle their ears. The fourth thing that we learned from the golden calf is that weak religious leaders will change their theology for cash. And you see that all over the American church today. They'll change their theology for cash. The compromising leader sanctifies sin to make it seem acceptable. Compromising leaders always try to find an excuse for leading people into sin. You remember there's an eight-step procedure. 
Number one, the leader will offer something visible, a focal point for the attention of the congregation. That was the golden calf in this case. Second, the leader will tell the spiritual lie to deceive the congregation. These be thy gods, O Israel. Third, the leader will open the door for additional lies to support his rotten theology. In this case, Aaron opened the door for a future side and slide back into apostasy by speaking of gods. Because in Egypt, they'd had gods, plural, not one god, singular. Fourth, the leader will tie mythology into historical reality. Today, for example, the charlatan charismatic faith healers tie the historical miracles of Jesus and the apostles into their frauds. Fifth, the leaders will arrogantly please, uh, be pleased with their own accomplishments. You hear them boasting. I mean, if you ever watch religious TV, like when they come on TV and show off all the expensive stuff that they've bought, like their airplanes and things like that, and they flash their rings in front of the screen like... I think it was Father Divine or maybe Reverend Ike, I don't remember which one. All these things, and they flash their rings, and they tell you, uh, you can get that too if you just had enough faith to send them the money that they're asking for. Remember, I told you, apostasy is never haphazard. It's carefully thought out, it's carefully planned, and it is frequently empowered by demonic forces. Sixth, apostasy is always tied to some form of true worship. Usually there are two components. Number one, a visible focal point of true worship connected to a visible focal point of false worship. Remember, they were, Aaron was saying, this, this is Jehovah, and he shows them the golden calf. And we're going to have a feast to the Lord. So they're going to do something that's related to true worship, have the right name, have a feast to the Lord, but the focal point that's tied to it is the golden calf. And number two, the second thing that apostasy always ties to true worship is vis pleasurable audience participation. Pleasurable audience participation. We learn later in the text that what that so-called pleasure was was a drunken orgy. Seventh, apostasy always offers something new that motivates people to be on time. Here the people could hardly wait for the new day to dawn when they would get to worship the golden calf, a god that would never criticize them for their sin. If you're living in sin, you'll want to go to a church that makes you feel good and never criticizes you for your sin. And the sins can range from being consistently late for church to sex outside of marriage. Verse 6 says, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's the verse that we just read a moment ago that was quoted by Paul over in 1 Corinthians, and he says that was written for our exhortation so that we wouldn't fall into the same kind of sins that they fell into. And they fell into the worship of the golden calf. They called it Jehovah. They brought peace offerings and they brought bird offerings, which were offerings required by the Lord. And then they had a sex orgy. Paul says that's an example for us in the church today. Eighth, apostasy is like drugs. You keep coming back for more. You can't break free from it. After making their initial small investment, which was the earrings that they had in their ears, and they gave them, they, Aaron made the golden calf, then they made big investments to their God. They brought two different kinds of offerings. Bird offerings, that costs money. And they brought peace offerings, that costs money too. And neither one of those offerings related to the sin of the worshiper. Every offering in the Old Testament was given for a specific purpose, and it represented something symbolically in relation to the worshiper and God. The bird offerings and the sin offerings were not related to sin. That's very important because they were about to get involved in some really gross sin. They were about to have sex outside of marriage. Bird offerings showed complete surrender to the God that you were worshiping. Bird offerings were not related to forgiveness of sin. In the Old Testament, only sin offerings and trespass offerings dealt with confession and forgiveness of sin. Check it out for yourself. I mean, go get an Unger's Bible Dictionary, Unger's Bible Handbook. Look it up. I mean, Dr. Merrill F. Unger, who used to, was the head of the Old Testament Department at Dallas Theological Seminary uh, years and years ago, has written some outstanding works. Uh, he was one of these guys that was a walking encyclopedia about everything in the Old Testament. And uh, I tell you, if you don't have a copy of Unger's Bible Dictionary and Unger's Bible Handbook, you ought to get copies of that because it will give you incredible insights as you do your own scripture study. But check, check me out. You don't have to believe me. Test what I say by the Bible. That's what the um, New Testament people did. Burnt offerings were an act of surrender to worship the God to whom the offerings were made. In this case, the Jews were surrendering to worship the golden calf. Number two, peace offerings were fellowship offerings. 
They were designed to show that you were in fellowship with God, in this case, the God of the golden calf. There were three different kinds of peace offerings. I listed these for you last week. Number one, the thank offering. Number two, the vow offering. Number three, the, th the free will offering. And I gave you the references on that last week. Here, the Jews were doing three things in relation to the golden calf. They were thanking the golden calf for bringing them out, up out of Egypt. That's the immediate context. Number two, they were making vows of consecration and surrender to the golden calf. And number three, they were showing their special non-obligatory appreciation of the golden calf and what the golden calf would allow them to do, in this case, have a drunken sex orgy. We know exactly what the people wanted out of their new God and what they wanted him to approve. It was a God that reminded them of the gods of Egypt, which also approved all kinds of immorality. You see, they expected the golden calf to approve a sex orgy. It says, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And we know that that phrase, it's directly connected to the golden calf, is a reference to indulging in carnal pleasure because the text specifically says that. Exodus 32, 22. And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord, speaking of Moses got mad about this, thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief, and he's avoiding all blame himself, he's putting it out on other people. For they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it me, and I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Yeah, right. And they just threw the gold in, and sure enough, out walked a golden calf. <laughs> oh, ask me another one to believe. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto the shame of their enemies. They rose up to play, and they didn't want their clothes to get in the way. Do you think God is happy with that? Perverted wickedness. There are people in churches today that do that kind of stuff. They don't think God's going to judge their sex sins. Well, listen to what happened. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and he said, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out among the gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Kill all those naked drunks that are lying around having sex. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and their fellow the people in that day about 3,000 men. God killed 20,000 more. There were 23,000 altogether. Paul quotes that passage in, in 1 Corinthians 10. These are examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Dancing naked in front of a pagan god was standard practice in many of the ancient cultures, and Aaron brought it right back into Israel. And there are preachers today who bring it right back into the church because they condone all that kind of wickedness and don't ever say anything about it. But now, not only did the Levites kill the naked, drunken fornicators who were playing around, but God sent an additional plague to kill more people. Verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Uh, <laughs> you know, the people made the golden calf. Aaron made the golden calf. Why? Because the people were the ones that gave the golden earrings, and Aaron's the one that fashioned it. They were co-conspirators. They were both equally guilty. Let me remind you, God still kills people today who claim to be Christians and are having sex outside of marriage. In fact, God uses the devil to do it. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. But now I hold unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother or a fornicator, if a brother be a fornicator, or covetous. That's idolatry. Paul says, Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5, covetousness is idolatry. A brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. You don't even have lunch with them. Now, what kind of plague did God use to kill more people than the Levites killed? Remember, the Levites killed 3,000. God killed 20,000. The word that's used for plague here in the text is frequently used of the disease of leprosy in the Old Testament. 
Leprosy was a nasty disease. There are still a few leper colonies in the world today. It's called Hansen's disease now. But um, a few leper colonies where people literally rot to death. And as the disease takes over their body, parts begin to fall off. Their fingers rot off. And their toes rot off. And their noses rot off. And their ears rot off. And a foot will rot off. And then a leg will rot off. And they're struggling to survive. And they got this blotchy, mottled skin. And it stinks. In the Old Testament, they had to put a cloth across their faith. And when anybody came close, they would have to cry out, Unclean! Unclean! And it might start out with just a little tiny spot. It doesn't look like it's starting out big, but just a tiny spot. And if they had one of these spots on their skin, they would have to go to the priest, and the priest would see whether or not it was a boil or whether it was leprosy. And if it was leprosy, they were cast out of the camp, and they couldn't come back into the camp. They were excluded, or we would say in church, excommunicated. And only if God chose to heal it could they come back in, and they would have to show themselves to the priest, and the priest would have to pronounce them clean. And Jesus healed lepers in the New Testament. And then he told them, what did he tell them to do? Oh, okay, you guys are free to go. No, he didn't say that. He said, now go show yourself to the priest. Because the priest, under Old Testament law, would have to examine it and say that they were healed from the plague of leprosy. Rather interesting because that word is also a word that is related to striking somebody hard or giving them a severe blow. It's uh, the idea of an overlord beating a rebellious servant severely. We might say in modern English, God was thrashing the living daylights out of his people because they were having sex outside of marriage. In fact, God was so furious that he was going to kill all of them. But Moses begged him not to do it. That's like God saying that he's going to kill this entire church because some of you are living in adultery or fornication. Let me read the entire context of Exodus 32. Starting in verse 7. The Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it. They have sacrificed thereunto, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. Now remember, this is written for us in the church. That's what Paul says in the New Testament. God recorded all the events that happened to Israel in the Old Testament because he wanted to teach the church a lesson. I have seen this people. Do you think God doesn't see us? Do you think God doesn't see you when you enter into a secret place to do your sin? I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Stiff neck means you arch your back and you stiffen your neck. You say, I don't care what God tells me to do. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do my own thing because I like to do it. It's fun. It feels good. I have pleasure in it. I'm going to do it. I don't care what God says about it. Because after all, he's not doing anything to me right now. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to get away with it. You will not get away with it. You will not get away with it. God is long-suffering. God designs his long-suffering to lead you to repentance. Repentance means not just being sorry for your sin and then continuing in it. Repentance means to turn around and go the other way. That's what that word metanoia, which is the word translated repentance, means. It means you're going east and you turn around and you go west. You are going north and you turn around and you go south. You are walking in the sin and you say, I repent. You turn around and you say, I'm no longer going to continue in sin. Paul says, what, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You quit living in sin. Otherwise, and you've heard it preached today, you're just like Israel. You're risking the wrath of God. You're risking death. You're risking his smiting hand and disease. You're risking a blow from which you will not recover. God will thrash the living daylights out of you. 
This is a serious warning. This is what God's word says. This is not my ideas. This is what's in the text. And Paul specifically applies this passage to Christians today who are living in immorality. Friends, that's serious business. They are a stiff-necked people. Listen to what God says to Moses. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them. Do you think God was angry? Do you think God was angry? He was furious. Wax hot. When you read the scriptures where it talks about God waxing hot in his anger, it talks about flaming fire, it talks about consuming enemies, it talks about wiping out entire armies. God says, my wrath is going to wax hot against my people. Not just against the enemies, not just against the pagans, not just against the Egyptians. Against his people. And God says, I'll get rid of them. Look at the last part of the verse. Verse 10. And that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. God offers Moses something. Moses is getting put to the test. Now Moses is frustrated with the Jews. They keep dragging their feet. They keep mumbling and grumbling. They keep complaining against him. They keep threatening to kill him. You know, Moses would really like to get rid of them, but he can't because God said you've got to lead them. He would like to throw them out. He would like to do something to quiet them down. He wishes he had a, a big, huge steel prison that would move by itself through the wilderness as he led them so they couldn't get out of it. So God says, okay, Moses, we can solve the problem. I'll kill them all, and I will make you, Moses, I'll make you into a great nation. In other words, God is offering to start over with Moses. Now, here's the difference between a man of God and an apostate. An apostate would have said, yes, let's go for it, Lord. You and me, we got it. We got it made. You kill them and I'll lead. Well, of course, nobody here yet, but uh, you know, you're going to give me a family. You make me a great nation. You made, you made Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a great nation. You can do that with me. An apostate would have said, yes, let's go for it. But Moses said no because Moses was more concerned with God's reputation than he was with gaining money and power. Even though it would have meant that he would never have to mess around again with the rebellious Jews. And for Moses, that would have been a great benefit. Moses said no. Listen to verse 11. Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Now, Moses uses three arguments why God should not kill everybody, but only kill the sex offenders. Moses uses three arguments why God should not kill everybody, but only kill the sex offenders. Number one, God was the one who delivered the Jews from Egypt. We just read that a moment ago here there in verse 11. God had declared to the people that he would and that he was able to bring them to the promised land. They hadn't gotten to the promised land yet. They're still in the middle of the wilderness. But God had said, I'm going to do it. When he led them out, he said, I'm going to take you unto a land that is flowing with milk and honey. Number two. The second argument that Moses uses, why God should not kill everybody but only the sex offenders, Second argument was the pagans would badmouth God if he annihilated the Jews. In other words, why would God give pagans a reason to blaspheme his name? Did you see it in verse 12? Here's the second argument. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Argument one was God delivered them and promised to bring them to the promised land. Argument two is, it'll give the pagans reason to blaspheme God. Argument number three, if God killed everybody, it would be inconsistent with the covenant promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And that would mean that, number one, either God was a liar, or God was incompetent, or God was impotent. If you don't keep your covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those are your only options. Either you're a liar, or you're incompetent, or you're impotent. Moses stands between God and the judgment of the people and puts his own life on the line and turns down the offer to become a great nation if God wipes out all of the Jews. I think there are very few of us who have that kind of character. To say, I will turn down all the good stuff for myself because I'm more concerned about the name of God. I'm more concerned about God's people. Even though they're stiff-necked and rebellious and stubborn and they treat me like dirt and they want to kill me, I believe the word of God. I believe the promises of God. God, you said, and you're a true God, I'm not going to take up the offer because I want you to keep your word. I don't want the pagans to blaspheme. I want you to keep covenant because you are God. Very few of us would have turned down the offer in the way in which Moses turned it down. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self. God, you took an oath based on your own character. You took an oath based on your own name and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Moses saying, remember God what you said? Remember God what you said? I'm holding you to your word, God. Now, that's pretty bold. Did you know what? You can do it too. Moses teaches us here a very important prayer principle. And I hope you get this down if you're taking notes, and I hope you're taking notes. A very important prayer principle is found all over the Bible. You can always pray the correctly applied promises of God. You can pray them back to him if those promises are based on his word. Because God's word is 100% true. It's absolutely true. God never lies. So you can pray his promises back to him. Because God never violates his word. But he expects you to know his word. You're not going to be able to pray his word if you don't know his word. If you don't know the promises of God, you cannot pray them back to him. But it's not just a matter of praying promises back to God. You have to apply the promises correctly. For example... I think I've given you this illustration before, but let me give it again because it's, a, it's one that happens all the time in churches. You cannot pray Psalm 2.8 as a missionary verse and then expect to see a lot of converts on the foreign field based on that verse. What does Psalm 2.8 say? I've seen this as a banner in missions conferences. Psalm 2.8. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Now, you take that verse out of context, that sounds like a great missionary verse, doesn't it? All you got to do is pray, and the mobs will come in. Pray, and thousands of unsaved, lost all over the world will trust Christ. And then they say, Psalm 2.8 says so. Oh, really? Now, there are three reasons in the context of that verse that prohibit claiming that promise for yourself and for missions today. First, the promise was not given to you. It was given to Christ by the Father. It's a messianic promise. Look at the other verses, starting in verse 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. That's not you, and that's not me. Verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. That's quoted by Peter in the book of Acts as applying to Jesus and the resurrection. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And what's your nearest antecedent? There's the next verse. Is, Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. Nearest antecedent is 
the Messiah, the one who has been set on the holy hill of Zion, the one who is God's son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. So number one, the first reason you can't grab that promise for yourself is because it applies to somebody else. Second, the context of Psalm 2 is the second coming of Christ at the end of the great tribulation. It's not even the rapture that we're talking about here in Psalm 2. It's the second coming. And it certainly does not apply in the middle of the church age, which was a mystery in the Old Testament, according to Ephesians uh, chapter, uh, two, uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 3 through 5. It doesn't apply to the church at all. Third, the context is judgment, not salvation. You can't use that for a missionary verse because the context is judgment. The context says that Jesus will smash the nations. The verse is not about Christians saving the nations. It's about Jesus smashing the nations. Look at the very next verse. You know, the one that, verse 8 was, Ask of me, I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And then what's going to... What's Jesus going to do with them? Verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Never take a verse out of context on a pretext. What's Jesus going to do to the nations at the second coming? He's going to smash them. He's going to break them with a rod of iron. He's going to take them like a big vessel and smack them on the ground. You've got to take the verses in their context. And that, of course, is what all the book of Revelation is about. So a song is wrong that says, all the promises in the book are mine. No. Some of the promises are to Israel, not to the church. You are not Israel. Some promises are to the church and not to Israel. Some promises are even to Egypt and some to Ethiopia. For example, over in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3, And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot, uh, three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Behold, therefore, I am against thee and against thy rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate. I don't think you want that promise. Uh, and uh, let's see, from the Tower of Syria and to the borders of Ethiopia. Or Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 4. And the sword shall come upon Egypt, and great pain shall be in Ethiopia. And the slain shall fall down in Egypt, and they shall take away the multitude, and her foundation shall be broken down. I don't think you want those promises to apply to you. The, all the promises of the book are mine? No, those are certainly not mine. Some promises are to apostates. You know, this is what God is going to do to them. Some promises are to the devil and his demons, what God's going to do to them. I don't think you want those promises. God has promised hell to unbelievers. Jesus promised the 12 apostles that they would rule over 12 tribes of Israel in the millennium. That clearly doesn't apply to you and me. I hope you get the point. Not all the promises in the book are for you. In fact, you don't want all the promises in the book to apply to you. To get God to keep a promise to you. Now remember, Moses is praying back promises of God. But Moses is applying them properly. And if you want God to answer your prayers, you can pray the promises of God back to him, but you've got to make sure that you're applying them correctly. To get God to keep a promise to you, you can only claim a promise that has been given to you, not to somebody else or to some other group. Second, you must apply the promise in the correct context. You must apply the promise in the correct context. That means you can only claim promises that are given to you in the context of of any requirements or stipulations that God has placed on the promise to receive it. You can't pray the promise and say, now give it to me, God, if you fail to keep the stipulations, if you fail to keep the restrictions. You cannot ask God, oh God, you promised me this. God says, yes, but I said you would get that if. Let me give you an illustration. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, doesn't that sound like a good promise? You need wisdom. Man, you're going through a tough time. You need to know what to do about it. Say, well, look, that's what it says in verse 8. And so you take verse, eight out of, uh, verse 5 out of its context. And you ignore the rest of the passage. You know what? You're not going to get wisdom. You're not going to know what to do. Because verse 6 gives some stipulations and requirements in order to get the promise. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Now, get verse 7. You've asked, you say, but God, you didn't give it to me. 
He said, did you ask in faith? Well, no, but you promised it. I said, you had to ask in faith. What are you going to get? Verse 7. For let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. In other words, God's going to say no to all of your prayer requests if you don't ask in faith. Now, what is faith? Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. You can't say, God, I'm believing with all my heart that you're going to give me a gold-plated Cadillac. And you're going to give me a chauffeur and you're going to give me this fancy big... No, no. That's not a prayer of faith. God never promised to give you those things. A prayer of faith is confidence in the word of God. What has God promised to do? And then you ask in faith. And God says, I'll give it to you. But if you don't ask in faith, let not that man think that he should receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In other words, the way that you ask your prayer request tells something about the rest of your life. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The way you pray tells something about the rest of your life. If you can't even get wisdom, which God generously gives to anybody who asks for it, because you don't have any faith, you're not walking by faith. And if you're not walking by faith, you're walking by sight. If you're walking by sight, you're walking in the flesh. You are not walking in the spirit. You are not walking in obedience to the word of God. And you will not get the request that God has promised. God makes stipulations for our prayer requests. In the text here, Moses claimed a promise that God had given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it was a promise for a specific group of people, and it was in the correct context. The specific group of people were the Jews that Moses was leading out through the wilderness. And because he prayed it correctly, verse 14, and the Lord repented of the evil. Oh my goodness, I didn't realize how late it was. <laughs> well, anyway, the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. You see, God always answers prayers, yes. They're prayed according to the promises of his word and are prayed in the correct context. I'm just going to close with these two verses because I want you to see it in this context. God always answers prayers with yes that are prayed according to the promises of his word. Write this reference down. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. Are you confident in God? You're confident that he's going to answer your prayer requests. That's walking by faith, by the way. That's praying by faith. This is the confidence. Man, I know it's going to happen. This is the confidence that we have in him. That if any, if we ask anything, oh, <laughs> it covers everything. Oh, boy, I I'm going to get it. Look at the restrictions. If we ask anything according to his will. Oh, you mean I can't ask for things outside the will of God? No. You ask for things that are in the will of God. We say, but how do I know the will of God? Read his word. His word is what reveals his will. Even in the little things of life, if you apply the principles of the word of God correctly, remember that goes back to our study of patience versus impatience. We don't want to study hard enough to know what are the principles that affect the decision that we're about to make. God has revealed everything in his word that is necessary for you to make every decision in life, even the most minute decisions, every day of your life. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And we know, not if we guess, we know that he hears us. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Now, there are three things in that uh, context that startling things that tie us directly back to the golden calf, but we'll have to save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power. It is a unit. It's not a bunch of disconnected stories. It's a unit because it came from the hand of the divine author who interweaves even the most minute characters together to form this great massive tapestry, this incredibly beautiful narrative that shows us who you are and who we are. It reminds us what you've done and reminds us, sadly, what we have done. It shows us your mercy and your grace and your judgment against sin. 
and then invites us to receive that mercy and grace through repentance and faith in Christ. Father, we pray that you'll take your word as it's been preached today, that you'll open our hearts to it, that you'll draw us to repentance, that you'll make us obedient, and that Jesus Christ will be glorified in our lives from this day forward. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.